Chapter One of the Story of a New Zealand River. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. The Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. Chapter One. Damnation! I wish they would hurry up. David Bruce stamped his numbed feet upon one of the few reliable planks in the landing stage which threatened to collapse under his vigour, and blew upon his hands, rough and contracted by the cold. The only person within hearing, Sonny Shoreman, a lanky youth whose manhood was not yet under way, hung shivering over the side of the black punt that was moored to the rotting piles of the little wharf. His hands were tucked under his armpits. His bottle-green eyes glared miserably up at the horizon, now tinged with a weak glow from the rising sun. "'Are you sure you told them seven o'clock?' demanded Bruce, kicking at a piece of lichen. "'Yes, certain,' mumbled Sonny. The tide, running out fast, made little wakes round the square ends of the punt, which was a huge coffin-like craft, full of furniture and boxes, partly hidden under a new tarpaulin cover. The creek, here little more than twice the width of the boat, ran deep between lines of mangroves, the dull green of their stiff leaves relieved but little by the flat yellow berries which seemed to continue the colour scheme of the clay in solution in the river, recently flooded by the spring rains. Walled up to a high horizon on either side was virgin forest, from which a mist, getting lighter every minute, was slowly lifting. The wharf, the punt, and the two men looked as if they had been dropped from the clouds into the depths of that remote ravine. There seemed to be no way in and no way out, but as the fog shifted they could see about half a mile along another gully, a small white school and a teacher's house, set on the side of a hill. The eyes of both Bruce and Sonny Shoreman now gazed with fierce interrogation upon those humble buildings. As they looked, the forms of a man, two women carrying babies, and a child, all laden with packages, took shape in the mist. Only occasionally, as they came on, were they seen by the impatient watchers, by the punt, for the road, which was carved around the spurs of the range, lay mostly under cover, and it seemed to Bruce that there passed eternities of biting cold before the welcome sound of voices and the squelching of thin mud made music for his urgent ears. Indifferent as to the personality of the boss's wife and children, who were to be his passengers, Bruce began to loosen the ropes. When the party finally appeared round a tea-tree clump and reached the creaking wharf, he turned, raising his cap to Roy Harding, the schoolmaster, and his wife, whom he knew well. Then he looked casually at Mrs. Rowland. He was instantly conscious of his deficiencies. The devil, why didn't I shave? he growled inwardly. As they moved on towards him, he suspected that Alice Rowland was what the washerwoman called a real lady, and he saw that in spite of a hard black hat and a rather ugly brown cloak, she was a young and very good-looking one, too. He saw that she was tall, and that though she carried a baby in a basket hung over her arm, she moved gracefully. He had time to notice her good colour, her straight features, and the coils of chestnut hair upon her neck before the party stopped before him. As Alice turned her grey day of judgment eyes upon him, with a look that instantly judged him and dismissed him from her consciousness, he realised how much she resented being formally introduced to him as an equal. He did not know that never before had she been presented to anyone who looked as unprepossessing as he did at that moment. He was only too conscious of the marks of his recent short but reckless whisky-drinking. His fine brown eyes were strained and bloodshot, his hands red and dirty, his dark hair uncombed, his hat guilty of indescribable disreputableness, his battered dungarees smelling of river mud, tar, and stale tobacco. It would have taken a connoisseur in types to have realized his possibilities. It was not remarkable that on that particular morning Alice Rowland failed to perceive them. She saw only the dirty clothes, the unshaven face, the bloodshot eyes, the shrinking manner, all that she had been taught to connect with the name of Pariah, and forgetting for the moment that she was to be dependent on him on an unknown river journey, she barely acknowledged his presence. Bruce had scarcely time to flush before Mrs. Harding turned to him, trying to ignore the unfortunate manner of the woman she had introduced. "'We have not seen you for three weeks. How is that?' she asked. Bruce smiled gratefully at her. "'I've been helping Mr. Roland with the house,' he answered quietly. 
why didn't you come up last night she went on we got up late and it took me till midnight to get these things aboard we shall have to hurry now it will take us all our time to get down on the tide he turned as he spoke and as he did so the child of the party who had been watching him stepped up to him her eight-year-old dignity was offended at having been ignored how do you do she said ceremoniously holding out a hand that was lost in a dark blue mitten Bruce stopped short to look down at her all he could see of her face was a pair of mischievous and inquiring blue eyes haloed by a voluminous and floppy bonnet before he thought he had taken that friendly little hand asia said her mother coldly mr harding will help you into the boat absurdly hurt david bruce turned quickly away from her but the child looked after him i will get in myself thank you she said to roy with a comical dignity as bruce undid the ropes he was vividly conscious of the little scene of embarkation helped by the hardings alice roland finally got herself her children and her packages all safely into the punt bruce felt sorry for her when he saw by her awkwardness and her uncertainty how utterly unfamiliar she was with travelling of that primitive kind and looking ahead for her he wondered how she would stand the rest of it in spite of her behaviour to him he liked the way she thanked the hardings for their fortnight's hospitality something about her attitude as she stood with her face upturned to them attracted him to a second glance as he began to shove the punt away from the piles then he walked round the side of it at the back of the family group and slid down into the tow-boat where sonny had the bow-seat good-bye mr bruce called the hardings together come along soon thanks i will he waved his cap back at them then with sweeping strokes which sonny shoreman ached to rival bruce swept the tow-boat ahead and the punt drew away from the landing the hardings stood till the last vestige of asia's waving handkerchief disappeared round the first bend then they looked at each other roy shrugged his shoulders poor thing said dory how ever will she stand it the lord knows she was rotten to bruce she'll have to learn sense she'll alter when she's had a few weeks of that loneliness and then david will shine besides roland once he is clean and shaved she spoke significantly he looked at her hm i hadn't thought of that she laughed with feminine suggestiveness well i have they walked back turning several times to watch the passage of the punt between the mangroves tears glistened in dory's eyes she read into alice's roland's future things her husband did not think of meantime in the punt alice occupied herself with the immediate problem of coping with the cold which was to be considered before the remoter issues of this dreadful excursion into unknown wilds betty who was three years old and the baby who had just had her first birthday both chose the occasion to howl piteously at this dislocation of accustomed ways alice who could not bear that anything belonging to her should misbehave in public exerted all her forces of comfort and cajolery asia heroically helped her mother with the children as she always called them but she burned to investigate this wonderful adventure presently when the baby was soothed to sleep on an improvised bed in a bath tin and when betty was pacified she felt she was free then she darted with a spasmodic rapidity of a squeezed wet bean from one part of the punt to the other scrambling over the tarpaulin and calling every few minutes in gasping whispers to her mother to look her life spent so far only in cities had contained no hints of the wonders of silence and space of the mysteries of forest depths and rustling trees of the strange ways of the free creatures of the air and earth she clasped her hands electrified and speechless as startled wild duck rose from hidden places or ungainly shags flapped an erratic course downstream or gaw-gaws croaked from the heights then alice stood up the only thing that seemed to belong to her in that incongruous setting of boxes and mattresses and common furniture was a piano which was packed in a heavy case it had cost bruce an anxious hour the night before till with the help of chance riders he had got it safely aboard against the end of it she now leaned her proud profile clearly visible to bruce who kept looking away from it and back again he wondered if the scenery was getting to her as it had got to him the first time he came down the magic river he vividly remembered the morning when he had piloted the boss to the kauri forest at pukikaroro it had been a case of the blind leading the blind down that winding channel but in spite of strandings in the mud and the boss's temper 
Bruce had felt the call of the wild, and had accepted the offer to stay. He wondered once, as he saw Alice's face turn towards a gorge in the mountains, if she felt about it all as he had done. He knew that one might well forget the petty facts of life in the midst of that tremendous scenery. The river was a mere thread at the bottom of the narrow valley, which was walled up on either side by precipitous hills that kept the sunlight out till midday. From the mangrove banks to the sky, a great variety of trees in fifty shades of evergreen covered every yard of space. There was a riotous spring color in the forest, voluptuous golden red in the clumps of yellow kofi and the crimson rata, and there were masses of greeny white clematis and bowers of pale tree ferns to rest the satiated eye. Stiff laurel like puriris stood beside the drooping fringe of the lacy rimu, hard blackish kahikateas brooded over the oak like titoki with its lovely scarlet berry. Nowhere in the world is there more variety. Here, nature hated the very beginnings of monotony, so she scattered a little of everything about those wonderful hills. Towering arrogantly above all else, on the crests and down the spurs, stood groups of the kauri, the giant timber tree of New Zealand, whose great grey trunks, like the pillars in the ancient halls of Karnak, shot up seventy and eighty feet without a knot or branch, and whose colossal heads, swelling up into the sky, made a cipher of every tree near. Round each bend there was a fresh gully, a new and stimulating vista, and everything there was a vibrating silence, a terrible lonely silence, but rarely broken by the note of a singing bird. In the springtime it was a cold, windy, rain-washed land. It lacked the fierce blues and flame colors of Australia. Its days never palpitated with the exciting hum of that tropical land. Its nights were chaste and chilly. No soft lascivious stars caressed its rare wandering lovers. Its winds growled harshly or sighed mournfully, blowing ever over dead men's bones. For the river and the hills were one of the gateways to the land of the lost. The first thing that struck Alice about it was its appalling loneliness. Every mile of it meant a mile farther from even such limited civilization as she had just left behind. Every hour of it meant so much more of life cut off from the only things she knew and loved. Every bend in the river meant another fearful look forward and another yearning look back. It was just eight o'clock now, and they were to go on like this hour after hour until two or perhaps three in the afternoon. For the last fortnight, she had been alternately shirking it and facing it. Each day had further intensified her fear. Once, as she turned, Bruce saw the expression on her face. All sense of hurt left him as he realized that she was horribly afraid. Only once had her gray eyes rested, carefully expressionless, upon his muscular frame, as it swung backwards and forwards with the ease of a well-oiled machine. She did not appreciate the fact that he was giving a magnificent exhibition of physical strength as he rode desperately to keep ahead of the tide. To her he was a bushman, one of the lawless oddments of humanity who had either fled from civilization as the result of evil deeds, or was drifting shiftlessly toward a wretched end. And as a servant of her husband, and a sometimes drunken one at that, he was outside her speculations. Each time that Asia, fascinated by the steady sweep of the oars, stopped at the front of the punt to watch them, she was called back. "'You must not stare at them,' Alice said. "'Don't they get tired, mother?' asked the child. "'No, they are used to it. They must be very strong.' "'Oh, yes, men are.' Presently the children woke up, and had to be fed, kept warm, and played with. When Alice next had time to look around, the face of the world had changed. There were no mountains on the western bank of the river now, and the eastern ones had dwarfed. The river, too, had widened out, swelled at intervals by smelly creeks sneaking from remote sources away among the hills. They passed fire-swept wastes and blackened ranges and valleys, where denuded kauri trees, now often standing alone like giant specters, held up their bleached heads imploringly to the sky. Once a gully opened out on a dark level wall of stiff kahikateas, and once a break in the ranges revealed on a distant green hill a solitary house beside a clump of friendly pines. Alice and Asia both saw it at the same instant. Is that ours? asked the child. I don't know. Asia bounded to the front of the punt. Is that our house? she called to Bruce. Asia! exclaimed her mother angrily. Bruce saw that the child had spoken, but he had not heard what she said. He stopped rowing. 
i beg your pardon he answered upset by her mother's tone asia hesitated go on you must ask him now said alice very low is that our house asked asia in a crestfallen voice no not yet i'm afraid you won't see it for some hours he spoke naturally but he had perfectly understood the significance of the little scene he and sonny shoreman rode on without stopping for two more hours then they came suddenly upon a broad bay and beach with a maori settlement nestled against the low hills behind canoes were drawn up on the sand and the sun shone on fields of young corn and freshly ploughed land they had now reached a channel that was permanently deep and there was no longer any danger of being stuck Bruce stopped rowing backed the towboat put his hands on the front of the punt and vaulted up on it i have to go ashore here for half an hour or so mrs roland i shall anchor the punt here you will be perfectly safe as he saw her fearful glance at the shore the maoris are quite harmless they won't come out to you they may call but that would only be friendly yes she replied rather stupidly for the first time she noticed his voice he swung out a heavy anchor asia watching him absorbed then he jumped into the towboat and he and sonny rowed ashore maori children playing on the beach ran up to him and women brilliant spots of colour waved their hands at him from the fields alice interested in spite of herself and asia in another ecstasy both looked on at the unfamiliar scene we'll get something to eat sonny and have a spell said bruce seeing by her watch that it was twelve o'clock alice unpacked mrs harding's kit of luncheon the children who had nibbled at intervals said they were still starving so alice spread out the sandwiches and the bottles of milk to look like a meal warm now under the sunshine of a glorious day she recovered a measure of cheerfulness and in an effort to make her children gay she learned for the first time in her life the delights of a meal out of doors they had scarcely finished when bruce and sonny returned without a word the men got the boats under way again acting on one of her sudden impulses asia took up a packet of sandwiches and as alice turned to the baby who had seized a knife she scrambled to the front of the punt and with friendly glee in her eyes she signalled with it to bruce alice moved round just as she lost her balance clutching vainly at the taut connecting rope and went down before she could utter a sound bruce who had seen it coming shot over the stern of the towboat and dived at the sinking blue bonnet there was an eternal moment of silence when alice knew they were both somewhere underneath the punt then she heard a splash towards the rear all right called bruce she heard him but she could not move she heard the swift strokes through the water beside the punt she saw sonny shoreman haul asia into the little boat breathing hard and dripping streams of water from his pockets bruce struggled in pulled the rope and handed asia who was spluttering and coughing but otherwise unhurt and unafraid over the end of the punt livid and speechless alice seized her and looked dumbly at bruce he was moved to swift sympathy at the agony in her eyes she is all right mrs roland just change your clothes at once and she will be none the worse then he jumped back and went on rowing all alice could feel was the sickening weakness that follows a sudden shock she stared at asia dripping before her as at some incredible thing the first thing to come back into her consciousness was a realization of fresh fears bound up with this new future new dangers to her children the victim of this misadventure who even at that age had a great sense of the dramatic coughed energetically and exclaimed with the air of a tragedy queen oh my nice new bonnet it's just ruined then she saw her mother's face what is it mother never mind about my bonnet i'll make the old one do she did not understand why she was suddenly seized and passionately kissed what were you doing to fall in gasped her mother as she opened a portmanteau full of dry clothes asia looked guilty i was going to give him some sandwiches mother he didn't have any dinner asia stood accused it had not occurred to her she flushed get your clothes off she said as she stood to form a shield round the child she seriously wondered how she was to treat a workman who had performed such service as bruce had she was kind rather with a trained consideration incidental to habits of good breeding than with a natural spontaneity that rushed forth to meet human beings and as a woman born in the ruling class she was inclined to take a good deal for granted in the serving class she would not have put baldly into words that it was bruce's duty to save her child but she unconsciously minimized the value of his action because he was her husband's servant also in action 
it always took her some time to decide how far precedent should act as a guide faced with a new situation her first sensations were those of indecision and helplessness after some minutes thought she took up the remaining packet of sandwiches and moved with it to the bow she was furious to find herself flushing will you have some sandwiches she asked looking down into bruce's steaming face he at once stopped rowing and stood up while sunny shoreman kept the little boat end on and steady i beg your pardon mrs roland bruce's fine eyes were as expressionless as he could make them she repeated her question thanks we shall be glad to he answered taking the package then he saw that she wanted to say something more i thank you i hope you won't catch cold she stammered looking at his wet clothes he wondered why it cost her such an effort to say that simple thing oh there's no fear of that thank you i'm used to it then as if she could not possibly have any more to say to him he dropped back into his seat here sonny he whispered handing him the sandwiches eat one whether you want it or not he helped himself to the other and then took up the oars again alice sat down in the punt feeling that the incident had somehow put her in the wrong some time over an hour later the punt crawled round a precipitous point on the right and down a long length of rippling river there stood out at the end of a line of white cliffs the outline of a small house against a splendid wall of bush the irrepressible asia rushed to the bow is that it she called and this time went unreproved it is smiled bruce that's it mother that's it she cried whirling about in the limited space she grabbed up betty who saw all sorts of things but not the thing she was supposed to see with the baby in her arms alice stood up again on the right bank she saw hills and gullies hills and gullies without end and on the left she saw the waste of low scrubland brown in patches from last autumn's fires startled wild duck rose from the hidden lagoons hundreds of curlew just arrived from siberia fed upon the shimmering mud-flats lines of mangroves marked the course of sluggish creeks nowhere was there a sign of habitation not a clump of pines not even a yellow line of a road as the punt passed in deep water close beside the bank alice saw peeping out of the fern on a mound above two small enclosures with rough unpainted crosses falling against the rotting palings these unknown graves were the last straw bruce saw her lips quiver he saw the look of desperation and despair in her eyes as she sank down out of his sight and her helplessness put him on her side for ever when at last alice raised her head again she caught her breath she found herself looking up a slope of grassland at a solid pack of scotch firs horizon high they evidently hid a house for there were outbuildings and cattle and sheep grazing in the field they had come suddenly upon it all round an eastern headland alice tried to calculate the distance between that friendly thicket and the small house at the end of the cliffs it did not look more than three miles but by the road it might be four or five and there would be a woman there perhaps some impossible rough farmhouse drudge but still a woman alice thought of babies to come the worst nightmare of this future life and thanked god from the depths of her orthodox soul for that clump of pines and that suggestion of home and neighbor as they moved on they saw that the river turned at right angles into the west instead of landing immediately below the house the rowers made a detour to avoid a mud-flat round which the channel ran this carried them over against the wall of bush to the end of a sand-spit that stretched from below the bank below the cottage almost across the river and that left only a narrow channel to carry the tide into the little bay that formed the heel of the bend as they approached the spit whose rocky end made a fine landing-place a short thick-set man with a bristly moustache red hair and a skin tanned to the toughness of leather left the house and walked rapidly down the bank and along the spit where two men waited with a sledge bruce observed that no handkerchiefs were waved at this end of the journey that the babies were not held up and told to greet their father and that even asia displayed little enthusiasm when the punt finally grounded against the shells there were no signs of eager greeting on either side but only an obvious well you're here from the boss and a composed acquiescence from his wife tom roland at once led the way along the spit and up the hill he did not offer to carry anything nor did he walk beside his wife but sprang nimbly up the slippery grass slope in front of her and waited impatiently now and then till she caught up with him asia trudged on behind 
holding tightly the hand of the cross and tired betty who was not equal to the bumps and stumbles at which she wailed miserably what's up you baby roared roland from the top bruce following dropped some of his load picked up the tired child and carried her to the door crimson with humiliation alice gave him a short look meant to convey the appropriate amount of gratitude too mentally sick to be interested she mounted the rough block steps and entered what was to be her home only the two front rooms were furnished sufficiently to be used the front door opened straight into the sitting-room which led directly into the front bedroom the kitchen and asia's room at the back had yet to be boarded in and lined then there was to be a lean-to to contain a scullery and a small porch the house stood well off the ground on wooden blocks through which the wind could blow what tune it pleased there was no question of painting it or furnishing it in any way of course the boss had visions of something more later on but this would have to do perhaps for years it was to be a makeshift something in the nature of a picnic tom roland who had lived most of his life in the open air had acquired the picnic spirit it had never occurred to him that it had to be acquired he expected his wife to reduce it immediately alice dropped onto a box realizing nothing but the cross baby in her arms and betty crying miserably over her knee oh mother began asia consolingly look at that lovely fire all that wood and that funny kettle alice looked at the glowing log fire in the crude brick fireplace and at the iron kettle hung from some invisible bar in the chimney the comfort of it did mean a good deal in that tragic moment she remembered it afterwards as one of the few inspiring memories of that first day it steeled her to look round the room she saw that it had but one window to its three doors which cut up its space and shrank it till its walls seemed to be closing in upon her it was lined but unpapered bags of sugar oatmeal and flour and boxes of tinged groceries were piled up in one corner of it there was nothing but a sack on the bare floor it all looked just about as hopeless and as near the end of everything as it could here cheer up said tom roland briskly it will be all right when it's fixed up kettle's boiling we'll have some tea he produced the thick cups he had been using a tin of condensed milk sugar and tea and in a manner that was meant to be helpful and reassuring he made it and poured it out forcing back tears alice drank it while asia reduced betty to good humor by rolling about a tin of meat a shadow darkened the doorway oh come in and have a cup of tea called the boss to bruce no thanks he answered promptly dropping inside the door the baskets he had carried up he did not wait to be urged but hurried down the slope for the rest of the afternoon alice had no time to feel sorry for herself there was too much to do by six o'clock the furniture was all placed and the beds set up then alice put the two tired children to sleep while asia laid the tea alice was grateful to mrs harding for a stock of cooked food enough to last for a day or two when she came out of her room she found asia dancing round a table neatly spread with cold chicken and homemade bread and butter and honey and cake it amazed alice to see how the child responded to this new and strange environment oh mother i love this place she cried the sight of the table and the glow of the fire and her piano in the corner and the sun setting upon the river and the lights upon the forest wall opposite and the great silence everywhere made up a mass of impressions so arresting that alice stood still for a few minutes to try to realize it all then she called her husband who with bruce was taking the last load off the sledge come along and have a snack he said at once to bruce thanks but i don't think i will they're having dinner at the camp that don't matter come along i'm not presentable protested bruce i would have to change my clothes very well we'll wait bruce knew the boss loathed waiting for anything he felt uncomfortable but he had no adequate excuse he and the boss had eaten together all along he hurried to the camp at the head of the bay shaved and flung himself into a suit that still bore the stamp of a tailored past it was the beginning of new self-respect never under any circumstances did alice roland see him unshaved again alice spent the minutes waiting for him in absurd unhappiness she was exasperated at her husband for asking him to the meal and she felt bruce ought not to have accepted the invitation she knew it would be all she could do to get through without some exhibition of feeling she thought at first of pleading as well she might a headache or fatigue but she felt that would only be delaying the evil moment 
she saw she would have to meet bruce again and again and the sooner she got used to it the better she could not get away from him or any other people the boss might have about in those two little rooms there would be no privacy for her lack of it would be one of the worst things she would have to face when bruce walked into the front room at the boss's answer to his knock he was in no wise conscious of the magnitude of transformation in himself after his long day in the open his eyes were clearer his nerves more steady the minute alice looked at him she realized the enormity of her mistake but it seemed just then only one misery more added to a day of horrors she dare not let herself think about it oh you do look nice doesn't he mother cried asia jumping up from a chair beside the fire and beaming upon him bruce's sad eyes lit up delightfully as he looked down at her and then he shot a swift glance at alice hoping to see some glimmer of response but the day had been too much for her she did not look at him and he knew by the change in asia's face that she had been sobered by one look from her mother but he understood the boss saved the situation by laughing asia's impulsiveness a source of woe to her mother was to him a constant stimulus to huge amusement so youngster he said you've got an eye for a man already sit down bruce indicating a chair by the table they all sat down and the boss began to carve the chicken as if he were charging an enemy all through the meal he dispensed what hospitality there was with a flourish showing himself absolutely ignorant of the subtleties of social intercourse excluded alice from the conversation by talking fast to bruce of timber measurements sucked chicken bones with audible approval whistled when he was not talking and generally destroyed the slightest chance for moments of reflection at any other time alice would have been humiliated by his behaviour but now she was grateful to him for saving her from any obligation to say a word all she did was to ask bruce if his tea was right and if he would have any more he had turned to her more than once trying as naturally as he could to include her in the conversation but when he saw that she could not or would not respond he gave it up immediately after the meal to alice's dismay they started to weatherboard the kitchen but the tired children slept on asia too worn out at last fell half dressed upon her mattress and so remained craving to get away from the hammering and from them alice slipped out through the front door she dared not go far away lest she be wanted and for the same reason she determined not to cry but when she had walked a few yards over the shaving littered grass she broke down suddenly she sank to her feet besides a bush at the top of the rise and burst into drenching tears how long she had cried she did not know when something in the night arrested her she dried her eyes and sobbing at intervals looked around her at her feet the tide crept lazily up the little bay which rounded off the angle of the river at low tide it was merely a circular mud flat swarming with little crabs and with a few small channels like ditches branched across it and dotted with shallow pools that reflected the sunlight or the moon and stars to her left three miles down the river steep ploughshare cliffs on either side of it made a gap that seemed to cleave the foreground from something always misty that lay beyond the river turned again on the far side of it to run on between low hills to the kaipara harbour that harbour alice knew opened into the tasman sea and through it came many a timber ship from australia and the world far away to the east of her a mile from the curve of the bay and towering into the stars a double coned mountain stretched forth its velvety shadow to meet the tide alice had been only vaguely aware of it that afternoon but now she stopped sobbing as she looked at its sombre dominance the rising moon made silver trellised bowers upon its crest while yet the river below lay plunged in gloom the maoris called it pukikaroro the seabird's hill because before the storms great flocks of the friendly gulls gathered inland wheeled for days about it screaming into the peace of its deep ravines immediately to the left of it there was another wonderful gap like a colossal doorway opening into a veiled vista beyond through it one bright star defying extinction by the moon still twinkled tom roland had told her that beyond that gap in the biggest kauri forest of the north lay his dreams of wealth and future glory alice looked from it into the wall of bush opposite her listening to the strange cries of the moorpork and the melancholy shrieks of the wekas from a swamp 
somewhere down the river came the low weird boom of a sort of bittern all round her there was a stimulating tang in the air and now and again a salt whiff from the open sea something she had never suspected in herself rose up to respond to it all she had nothing of the gypsy in her but she loved beauty more especially the beauty that was created as she would have put it by the hand of god and it was the hand of god that she saw in that night in that mountain that bush and that river for the moment she forgot the world that lay so far away the familiar ways of living the things she knew and wanted the kinds of people who mattered to her she looked up at the stars and she felt that god was there and that his protecting arm was about her she turned her head quickly hearing steps beside the house she saw bruce coming along the beginnings of a path that had been worn in her direction she was instantly a prey to conflicting emotions she had not the faintest notion how to bring ease into a situation in which she had been the first to put embarrassment all she could see was the hideous mistake and no way out of it never simple and direct she could not apologize or see that frankness might undo the tangle as she was partly hidden by the shrub bruce did not see her till he was almost up to her he made no attempt to stop but raised his cap said good night and passed on alice looked after him as he walked on towards the camp then the front door opened and tom roland looked out alice where are you he called come to bed she clenched her hands she had been away from him for a month she knew he had been thinking all afternoon of this hour she knew that he would not consider the fact that she was tired to death she knew he would simply feel injured because her vitality was not equal to his own and she knew that if later on the children woke and cried she would have to get up and look after them and that he would blame her for the disturbance in his eyes she would not be equal to her job she gave one hopeless look like that of a trapped creature round the mountain the bush and the river then she went in end of chapter one Chapter Two of the Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. The carpenter and Sunny Shoreman were working on the back shed, and Asia was amusing herself and, incidentally, Betty and the baby by playing with the shavings and chips. When she saw an astonishing figure making its way among the rushes and cutty grass bushes that dotted the slope of the green hill that rose like an overturned basin a few chains away from the back of the boss's house she sprang to her feet and called upon the carpenter to look it's a lady she exclaimed he grunted assent a real lady repeated asia her first impulse was to rush to tell alice then she remembered the astonishing figure came on every detail of its appearance was a never-to-be-forgotten fact by the time it paused beside the shed and surely only magic could have produced that small grand old lady in a stiff shot silk dress of green and gold with lovely old lace folded round her shoulders a funny little old hat of lace and velvet upon her fine grey hair distinction radiating from every inch of her in her hands she carried a card case of tortoise shell and gold two books and a magnificent bunch of violets her bright blue eyes rested approvingly upon asia's golden hair and stared with frank pleasure into the questioning depths of those dilated young eyes it seems to be a case of mutual surprise my dear she began i suppose you are asia roland and you must be the fairy godmother was the sharp reply the old lady laughed that is just what i shall be she said as she spoke asia's eyes fell upon the violets the visitor noticed the gasp of delight oh, you love violets she said asia nodded i brought them for your mother are you not going to ask me to come in oh yes please but my mother she's asleep she was so tired she said i wasn't to disturb her whatever happened she didn't expect you you see would you mind if we sat in the kitchen it's just finished and it's quite clean and i couldn't wake mother for anything it all came out with a rush the old eyes glowed indeed you shall not wake your mother 
I shall be very pleased to talk to you. Asia glanced at Betty and the baby, who were playing amicably. They will be quite good with you, she said sweetly to the carpenter, who remained quiet as to his doubts. Then she proudly led the way inside, talking quickly and with guarded softness. I can make tea quite well. I know how. I often make it for mother. Have you come from those pine trees? We saw them from the river. Mother wondered who lived there. You see, we feel so lonely. At least mother does. I like it here. But mother hasn't been used to a place like this. She doesn't like it. She doesn't say so, but I know. I always know when she doesn't like things. No, you can't sit in that chair. It isn't comfortable. I'll bring you mother's chair. She disappeared into the front room, leaving the old lady standing in the middle of the kitchen. She reappeared, staggering, with an ancient mahogany rocker which she cleverly steered without bumping through the door. The fairy godmother moved swiftly to help, but was waved airily aside. Asia placed the chair in front of the window. Now, sit there. You will look lovely with the light on you. Mother does. This is a special chair, very special. It was once my granny's. It came from England. Mother loves everything that comes from England. Now, you look just right. The child's eyes, glowing with admiration, looked the old lady up and down. The very godmother felt a very human lump in her throat. Now, I must put the violets into water, continued Asia. She went to the cupboard and selected a plain white enamel basin. She loosened the flowers and arranged the leaves round them. Then she buried her face in them for a minute and sniffed energetically. Finally, she placed the basin carefully in the middle of the bare cauldry slab table. You must have a garden, said the old lady who had watched her with increasing interest. I will give you plants. Asia whisked round. Oh, thank you. That will be lovely. We would just love a garden. Then with a grand manner. Now, I will get you some tea. The fairy godmother rocked slowly, while the child turned to the open fireplace, where the kettle hung, singing over glowing coals. All the while she prepared the simple tea, Asia chatted on with delightful importance. It was clear she felt to the last degree the exultation of entertaining so grand a personage. We have no biscuits, she said regretfully, but you won't mind, will you? I can cut bread and butter. We have a cow, so I can give you cream. Mother says it's a luxury, and we haven't many luxuries. You see, we are very poor, and you are very rich, aren't you? With another survey of the silk and lace. But you won't mind our plain things, will you? Mother says it doesn't matter what we have, it's what we are. And Mr. Bruce says plain things are beautiful. Do you know Mr. Bruce? I think he's lovely. Don't you? The old lady seized this chance with alacrity. I do know Mr. Bruce, and I do like him. It was he who told me you had arrived. Thank you. I take sugar one teaspoon. Mr. Bruce told me your mother has a piano. That's another luxury. Does she play much? Oh, yes. It makes me feel... Oh, she clenched her hands. And you love music, too. Tell me, where were you born? In England, I suppose? No, I wasn't, but mother was. She is English, very proudly. I was born somewhere in Australia. Mother told me once. I think it was Sydney. I don't really remember. I wish I could remember more. It's horrid to forget things, isn't it? The old lady choked on a mouthful of tea. Asia jumped up in alarm. Shall I slap your back? She asked. I always do mother's but the visitor waved her back, struggling with a fresh attack. Finally, righting herself, she laughed heartily. You amuse me so much that I can't help laughing, she explained. I hope your tea is as you like it, said Asia gravely, repeating her mother's formula. It is indeed, it is delicious tea. The smiling eyes noted the composed satisfaction on the child's face. For another half hour, Asia fired questions at her enchanted visitor, who continued to rock slowly in the warm band of window light. Suddenly a figure appeared in the middle doorway. Oh, mother, Asia sprang up. Here is a lady who has come to see us. She is a real fairy godmother. I have made her tea. For a second, Alice stood dumbfounded by that vision in the sun glow. Then recognizing the type of her amazing guest, she crimsoned with humiliation to think that such an elegant person sat within full view of a bucket of dirty water, a box of saucepans, and an untidy corner of groceries still waiting for promised shelves. 
the visitor stared frankly at her tall and graceful figure simply dressed in dark blue gingham and at her fine head wreathed with thick plaits of copper-tinged hair she knew instantly what was disturbing her she rose up out of the rocker her blue eyes full of mischief yes i'm in the kitchen and do you know why alice stared at her because you were tired and asleep and must not be disturbed whatever happened and to avoid disturbing you asia brought me here and told me to talk in whispers and i have not enjoyed anything so much for years now you know you do not have to apologize she held out her hand still too astonished to speak alice took it and looked at her ah oh, i would know anywhere that you were english said the old lady with undisguised satisfaction yes murmured alice thank god for that these awful colonials get on my nerves they think and act as if england didn't exist it will be delightful to have an englishwoman to talk to again i am mrs brayton i live at the back of that hill indicating it with a nod as she sat down in the pines yes in the pines oh gasped alice unable to realize all at once this good fortune then she saw the violets tears rushed to her eyes i know just how you feel cried mrs brayton impulsively you've been here one week and you think it's the end of everything and that you'll die and that there's no god i know i felt that way but i've been here nearly fifteen years and i have grown to love it i wouldn't live anywhere else now you'll feel the same by and by i have my son and my old english servants and my garden and my library and all my own things about me and i get the london papers and the reviews and magazines and i have a magnificent view i tell you i love it and you can be happy here if you want to alice struggled with her amazement i can see you're tragic my dear you must be cured of that you must think of the compensations you must have a garden i will send you plants i find there is nothing like a garden for soothing the nerves and giving one a good opinion of god's ways and the country is the place for children and books nothing like it i know the first week is paralyzing but you have got over it now and soon you will begin to realize the bush and that mountain and the river and they will mean more to you than you think no place can bury you my dear we bury ourselves i'm an old woman so i can lecture you and if i have stood it you can you are young and you have children to help you out her eyes rested on asia who sat leaning forward listening feverishly alice flushed and for a moment there was an eloquent silence then betty and the baby tumbled in from the yard laughable objects of dirt and crossness seeing that alice was ashamed of them mrs brayton took her in hand now don't be cross with them children ought to be dirty and hungry it's their natural condition mine always were and what does it matter whether i see them or not what does anything matter in a place like this except that we be human you can't bring drawing-room conventions here my dear this life is real artificial things are ridiculous in it while alice struggled with the discomposure that she could not immediately control asia lured the children outside with diplomatic promises of refreshments will you come into the front room alice tried to smile the old lady wondered how anyone as good-looking as she could have remained such an iceberg they walked into the front room alice carrying the rocker ah a brinsmead said mrs brayton her eyes on the piano yes said alice glad that she had something good to show by the time they sat down she had recovered some of her self-possession mrs brayton took in at a glance the tasteless and poverty-stricken appearance of the little room apart from the piano there was not a thing in it to interest her she saw that there as yet were no pictures no books no ornaments she knew that the wooden sofa and the cane chairs were the cheapest things of their kind that could be bought and she guessed that the girl before her had somewhere in her past known a very different setting she noticed her shapely hands the poise of her head the unmistakable signs of generations of culture do play to me she said looking at a pile of music on the top of the piano i'm badly out of practice alice began nervously she hated to play before strangers oh everybody says that but you will have to begin to play to me some time so why not face the evil moment now the old lady smiled mischievously at her 
facing the evil moment was not one of alice's strong points but she could not resist that smile uncertainly she moved to the piano and chose a volume of chopin through nervousness she made one or two mistakes but in spite of that she played a nocturne and a prelude with great feeling and brilliant technique mrs brayton was amazed and delighted my dear she exclaimed frankly i need hardly say i didn't expect to find you when i set out to call on tom roland's wife now i don't mean anything against him he's one of the few colonials i thoroughly admire but how could one expect that he would have an accomplished musician for a wife oh what your music will mean to me my playing days are done but my old broadwood is still fairly good you must come and play to me often and you can play with david bruce have you heard him play the violin alice's look of confusion and astonishment was not unexpected no she stammered flushing furiously you haven't went on the old lady remorselessly well he plays beautifully and has kept up his practice you have met him of course yes answered alice most uncomfortably mrs brayton pounced upon her my dear i hope you have not been putting on airs with poor david let me tell you he is a gentleman they don't breed anything like him out of england he is one of the few people i invite to dinner he is one of the most interesting men i have ever met and when we english people find ourselves away in places like this we can't afford to snub each other because of a difference in the work we do we drop all that when we leave england when i met david bruce first he was digging gum but when i found out he read voltaire and played the violin i could have fallen on his neck and wept for sheer delight all work is the same here whether you are paid or not and whether you work for yourself or not my dear you are very young and you have been here only a week and you are feeling very badly about everything but you will learn that there are no class distinctions here and you must take down your barricades i was like you i had to you must forgive me i am a chattering old woman mrs brayton stood up and put her hand on alice's shoulder don't be offended she said alice fought to keep back tears i'm not offended she tried to smile she knew she could not resent anything this elegant old lady might say nothing but gratitude for the sound of that cultured voice filled her heart but she foresaw horrible complications arising out of her reception of david bruce mrs brayton sat down again how many children have you she asked abruptly three answered alice grateful for the change and you were a widow you must have been married very young the first time i don't approve such early marriages i think english parents make a great mistake to allow them one thing i like about this country is that the women work and learn something about life and men before they marry yes said alice not in answer to anything mrs brayton detected the coldness in her tone how far away do you live her abruptness was almost rude but mrs brayton ignored it she saw she had ventured on a forbidden topic our property borders yours but we are more than two miles apart by hill and gully do you ride no i do not well you can learn it is not hard and then we shall seem much nearer whatever brought you to this place asked alice unable to resist the question harold came up here land hunting soon after we arrived in new zealand he came out purposely to farm and as he is the only human i possess i had to come too i wept and protested and declared i'd die and he said i didn't have to come if i didn't want to and he took no notice of me there comes a time you know when our children do what they want to do and i don't blame them it's their right and it makes them more interesting of course i wanted most to be with him or i would have done something else myself so i settled down to it and we made a house and garden then we planted an orchard and got cows and fowls and bees and soon had no time for introspection it's five years since i went to auckland they call it a city that little village i don't care if i never see auckland again no give me my garden and my view of the river and the smell of burnt fern and my english papers alice listened humbly to this spirited chatter thinking herself the only white woman of her type who could ever have met so awful a fate she had inwardly raged all through the week anticipating her own degeneration and here before her 
after fifteen years of it there had stepped as if straight out of an english drawing-room this silk begowned old aristocrat fragrant with the scent of violets in a burst of gratitude for her presence in such a place she unbent oh i am so glad to find you here she said mrs brayton smiled well you are something of a discovery yourself we must do all we can for each other you must have a garden and fowls nobody can be despondent with fowls about i have grown to love animals even pigs you must make roland put up a fence and fix up a fowl run haven't you any books only a few i have not unpacked them yet what a mistake it might have done you good to look at them i have quite a library you can have as many books as you want i have brought you mrs humphrey ward's latest and a wonderful new novel called the story of an african farm by an olive schreiner new writer to me but perhaps you have seen them i have not and i shall be very glad to read them said alice gratefully it was very kind of you to bring them do you read french asked mrs brayton laying the books down on the table yes that's good do you know voltaire no now don't say you're a puritan said the old lady who had guessed she was i'm afraid i am rather answered alice doubtfully then you must be cured puritanism is an awful disease you must read voltaire i consider him as valuable as the bible i shouldn't like to face the world without him are you a churchwoman to mrs brayton there was only one church no i am not replied alice uncomfortably not a wesleyan i hope in obvious alarm alice laughed suddenly her whole face lighting up mrs brayton thought it was a pity she did not laugh oftener no i'm a presbyterian oh that's all right with great relief it's a state church anyway and they do educate their parsons we have a nice young curate in this diocese he will be coming to see you i hope you will come to the kaiwaka church sometimes there is no presbyterian church anywhere about thank you i will come dear me mrs brayton rose i shall be left out in the dark if i stay any longer i want you and your husband to come to have dinner with me some day next week say friday oh thank you as they walked towards the door but i can't leave the children that's true well i'll get eliza king she's a good reliable girl she lives in kaiwaka and often works for me i'll send her down to look after them they will be quite safe she's excellent with children and she will ride and can go home at any hour she is not afraid but please i can't allow you will just allow me to do as i please my dear you can't come without someone to look after your children and i want you to come i'm pining to know how the world looks nowadays i'm just as glad to discover you as you may be to find me i shall send eliza king on friday and come early in the afternoon so that you can see my garden oh and bring asia yes now i won't forgive you if you don't and don't say you don't have any clothes or any nonsense of that kind as you have told your child it isn't what we have it's what we are that counts if you talk philosophy to your child live up to it they had walked out of the front door and round the house at mrs brayton's last words alice laughed again meeting the old lady's eyes what a joy to have such a child said mrs brayton before alice could reply they came in sight of the back door and david bruce who had some fresh fish in his hand he put them down on the doorstep and turned oh david how are you cried the old lady i've expected you up for your violin i can't shake hands i'm fishy he said raising his cap to them well if you are not busy you can walk up to the fence with me and see me through i nearly tore my dress coming down with pleasure good-bye my dear said mrs brayton turning to alice i shall see you next week and remember when you are inclined to feel blue that whatever happens you will have an englishwoman and with a nod at bruce an English man to see you through the gloved hand rested for a moment on alice's arm alice mumbled something but could not keep a tremble from her lips she turned aside hurriedly went inside locked herself into her room and wept after saying good-bye to asia who had rushed at her from the kitchen mrs brayton stepped out with bruce up the field i've invited the rollins to dinner next friday can you come too she looked quizzically at him he smiled back at her not with them just yet please i see she hasn't discovered you that's nicely put she is very young and uncertain and very proud and conservative but very attractive isn't she what the devil made her marry a man like tom roland 
hanged if i can guess he has great qualities but i doubt if they appeal to her she won't like his skirmishes with other women well my dear lady what woman would mrs brayton laughed oh some of them don't worry they go and do likewise i dare say should you think of suggesting it to mrs roland don't be absurd david heavens but she is armor-plated isn't she if i had a husband like that and a child like that i should find it rather a strain keeping up the family dignity i say she does we must educate her out of it yes i think you'd better go gently oh i have won her now david it's you who have the work to do laughed the old lady it is rather a dramatic thing isn't it that a group like that should have landed here she looked round at the mountain the river and the bush it's just as dramatic that you should have landed here he smiled i should like to see her face when she meets your house and garden he held the wires of the fence apart for her stood a moment as she walked on and then returned to the bay End of chapter two chapter three of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three hand in hand alice and asia paused at the wooden gate outside the double wall of pines oh mother whispered the child breathlessly clutching her hand through the trees they saw hot masses of colour they heard the deep hum of a billion bees they sniffed a sensuous air heavy with known and unknown scents trembling with anticipation they opened the gate and stole in a yard or two only to stand again some gardens like great masses of complex machinery arrest and fascinate the intellect and satisfy one sense of arrangement of clockwork management they have no mysteries however no nestling places no dream compelling nooks but inside that phalanx of pines above the river there grew a wonderful garden with all these things a garden of dreams a garden riotous with life a garden of brilliant sunlights and deep shades a garden of trees that hid the stars and of shy flowers barely peeping from the ground a whispering garden full of secrets and suggestion a garden where there was always something more to know trees from england trees from the semi-tropical lands and trees from the native forest grew there side by side there were creamy magnolias pink and salmon lysiandras sweet laburnum banana palms white trailing clematis the scarlet kofi and bowers of tree ferns azaleas and jasmine and lilac and mock orange bushes were dotted about at random on the lawns there were beds and beds of stocks and geraniums and roses and sweet williams and snapdragons and larkspurs and lupins and lilies and late narcissi and the anemones and early gladioli there were jonquils in the grass and violets and primroses filling up odd spaces everywhere there were honeysuckled summer-houses and ivy-wreathed stumps and marble bowls on rough stone pedestals overflowing with creepers climbing roses arched the pathways damp thatched pavilions sheltered fragile ferns a natural spring bubbled up to form a trickling stream that flowed hidden by ferns through a corner and on down the hill in a little gully of its own making to the river everywhere in that garden trees and plants and shrubs leapt at you from the earth with a wild joy in living in spreading in grasping sunward in the midst of it half smothered in creepers stood a bungalow house surrounded by broad verandas every one of them a sweet-scented arbor calling one to pause and stay a while alice stood still fighting back tears she could not then or ever after put into words what that revelation had meant to her mother don't cry said asia pitifully are you afraid Shh, she answered harshly just then a piercing scream curdled their blood but before they could move there stepped into the sunlight on the lawn a few feet away a peacock with his tail outspread he stood still as he saw them proudly displaying his glory to their astonished eyes a peahen who had followed stopped too regarding them curiously asia felt queer she was certain now that by some invisible magic they had been spirited off to fairyland the creaking of a wheelbarrow on the path broke the spell mrs brayton came into view and saw them oh there you are she called dropping the barrow what is it oh the birds they won't hurt you come on she wore an old and grimy holland dress short to immodesty her son declared 
showing in full her frayed elastic side boots and thin legs her little hands were lost in thick leather gloves her head hidden in a straw hat tied under her chin anything more unlike the fairy godmother of the week before could not be imagined i'm afraid we have come too soon began alice indeed you have not i have expected you for an hour did you think to find me dressed up and sitting in my drawing-room with my hands folded wasting time waiting for you well you were wrong you see now will you like to see my flowers yes please said alice warmly the old lady saw they were overcome it was one of the delights of her life to spring her house and garden upon the unwary many an unsuspecting curate fresh from england and sore at his exile into the northern wilds had landed at that garden gate to be astounded and humbled and grateful and stimulated and educated by turns many a derelict from a titled english home driven by degeneration to the gum fields had strayed here to get once more a glimpse of what he had left behind and to have self-respect for an hour again and to learn what was happening in england and from the lips of an englishwoman whose voice stirred up a horde of good intentions destined only to pave hell as of yore as she well knew but none the less her house and her news and her time were for every one who passing by came in to beg a share of them you must have flowers to take home said mrs brayton all you can carry and you can pick them yourselves anything in the garden detaching a pair of scissors from her belt she handed them to asia there my dear you cut them off nice long stalks but don't pull at them to disturb the roots oh she won't yes she will do it quite rightly she can't hurt anything my garden belongs to everybody i am particular about my conservatory i don't give things out of it and i notice that it's always getting blights and insects i suppose that's a judgment on my selfishness you are not picking anything i can't believe that i can it doesn't seem real said alice nervously oh nonsense this isn't a public park help yourself asia show your mother how to pick flowers the child got the spirit of it first she rushed about in ecstasy pointing at things she wanted and looking at mrs brayton for approval the approval never failing she began to believe it was all true and helped herself alice followed more timidly not taking the biggest and best things as asia did till her arms too were full oh mother isn't this lovely asia ran up to her with as many kinds of flowers as her arms would hold mrs brayton's eyes grew misty as she looked at them it was obvious to her that life for them had lacked many simple joys what can we do with them all we have nothing to put them in you have bath tins and buckets said the old lady use them alice smiled into a cluster of tea roses mrs brayton led the way to the front veranda asia rub your boots well said her mother fearfully you can take them right off my dear and keep them off till you go if you won't catch cold i love children in their bare feet this was another shock to alice who began to realize that her notions of propriety would never be of any use here asia took her boots off on the veranda mat and then fearfully reverently as men tread before the shrines of their gods they entered by a wide open french door a large library and music room which opened through an archway upon a rose-red drawing-room before they had time to get more than a first blurred vision mrs brayton rang a little bell and there appeared in the doorway a prim and aged maid in a black dress with a spotless cap and apron tea please mary and will you help me to carry out these flowers and put them into water yes mum instantly alice felt as if she were back in london it could not be a dream she must be there that particular kind of yes mum in the wilds of new zealand was absurd a figment of the imagination she did not know that many a man from the gum fields that even bruce had felt as she did about it sit down said mrs brayton and excuse me for a few minutes i must clean myself left alone alice and asia stared in wonderment about them facing them on a pedestal in a corner by the archway stood a cast of the winged victory of samothrace round the walls above the rows and rows of books hung engravings of the great cathedrals of europe an open fireplace in plain brick took up a quarter of the wall opposite the drawing-room on the mantelpiece was a row of old brass candlesticks and on the hearth heavy old brass irons set straight before it was a deeply faded lounge on which a whole family could doze and dream a grand piano filled in one corner 
bowls of flowers and bronzes and busts of great musicians stood upon the top shelves above the books there were well-worn persian rugs upon the dark polished floor the drawing-room was an old-fashioned overcrowded treasure-house of things dear to the searcher after the choice and the antique rare engravings and quaint water-colours in tarnished gilt frames hung on the faded pink walls there were cabinets full of china and glass of old silver and jewellery of enamelled and metal snuff-boxes of fans and curios valuable chinese and japanese porcelain vases stood in corners and against the walls elaborate beadwork fire screens hung from the white marble mantelpiece upon which stood four great silver candelabra an alcove made a little gallery for a group of apollos and venuses and muses there were polished inlaid tables with slender legs and graceful chairs covered with silk and tapestry two spider-legged lounges looked comfortable with an abundance of cushions the floor was completely covered with a crimson carpet three french windows hung with rose silk curtains opened out on to the veranda and a gorgeous bed of stalks everything glowed with a voluptuous light that filtered through these hangings the white venuses were toned to a delicate pink there were luminous splashes on the oriental vases and deep red lights waved over the beaded screens it was not a room to talk in it was too swamping too luxurious if you sat in it for long you wanted to get back into the library where you got the fascinating suggestion of it it was an enervating room it affected you like an over-hot bath it made you want to lie down and doze and dream among the cushions but seen from the cool severe library with its restrained tones of cream and brown the red room was stimulating and alluring like a mephistophelian vision of a forbidden feast alice sat half dazed it was too incredible to be believed at once thinking her mother absorbed asia gradually wriggled off her chair stood up and stole cautiously toward the drawing-room alice came back to reality with a start her nervousness made her unusually sharp asia come back at once you must not move or touch anything or make a remark about anything you hear me yes mother said the child sitting down sadly she was craving to explore and ask questions about everything she saw in a few minutes mrs brayton returned the fairy godmother again in black velvet and lace she was followed by the maid with the tea you did not expect to get a real english tea within a fortnight of your arrival i'm sure she smiled do you know oscar wilde now don't look horrified he writes awfully clever things and people will all be talking of them in ten years time he says that to expect the unexpected shows a modern intellect now if you had had a modern intellect you would not have suffered half as much as you have about coming to these wilds for you would have known that something surprising would turn up i'm always preaching you will get used to it the maid handed alice and asia their cups of tea and then retired you have been living in auckland boarding-houses for some time i believe yes answered alice wondering how much of their private life roland had told her ah uh, a sort of fifth-rate bloomsbury atmosphere with everything from your soul to your washing under the eyes of the landlady i know demoralizing it would take the sense of adventure out of anybody and i should imagine that in a new zealand boarding-house without english service would be like a bed without a mattress alice laughed i cannot say that i enjoyed the life but it was convenient and as my husband did not decide for some time where he would buy bush we could not settle down in a house no of course not how long have you been in new zealand a little over five years and before that you were in australia yes that's where i was born wasn't it mother broke in asia then she knew by the look in her mother's eye that she had broken one of the commandments yes replied alice forbiddingly mrs brayton saw that alice froze at the approach of personal questions to divert attention from the subject she turned to asia my dear you needn't sit up like a statue all the time give me your cup you may get up and look at my things asia looked at her mother obviously perplexed oh i see went on the lady you have been instructed not to well your mother only meant till i gave you permission i know you won't touch anything and be careful not to bump against things wild with delight and with her hands carefully folded behind her asia trod as if she were in a room full of people with headaches she was too overcome to speak she stole about standing 
rapt in front of things that attracted her once she put out her hand to pat a luxurious chair but drew it back fearfully and looked to see if she had been observed mrs brayton who had been conscious of her impulse gave no sign soon afterwards forgetting the laws of behaviour and all the accumulated don'ts of her past experience asia whirled round bursting with excitement mother she whispered loudly and feverishly come and look mrs brayton was quicker than alice you go and look she commanded almost fiercely don't you ever refuse that request in my house alice was too astonished to be offended she felt that something personal and tremendous lay behind the old lady's tone and flashing eye without a word she rose and walked to the archway and took the impulsive hand that asia thrust at her i couldn't help it mother said the child sadly suddenly remembering never mind said alice gently what is it asia pointed out through the french windows at the peacock who stood there looking as if we were about to walk in mrs brayton following shook her fist at him will he come in asked asia excitedly quite likely i found him gazing at the piano one day last week asia gave a little shriek oh do let him in she said i don't know my dear i don't want him to develop the habit he will knock things over you can shoo him away gently and then you can run about the garden for a while but don't go near the bees alice returned with her to the library don't try to dominate that child reactions from domination are inevitable and they are very painful things and think less of behavior and more of being human mrs brayton squeezed alice's arm with a sick feeling of inadequacy and hating to feel she was in the wrong alice sat down it had never occurred to her to doubt her method of training her children no one had ever dared to criticize her management of them but she could not resent mrs brayton's words she only felt hurt to think she fell short in the eyes of the old lady who had already gained a strong foothold in her affections mrs brayton ignored her change of manner now i want you to play to me she said emotionally charged and determined to make the most of her one accomplishment alice went to the piano her delight at the beautiful tones of the old instrument helped to kill her nervousness after a few bars she felt herself alone as she played the appassionata and the pathetique it seemed to mrs brayton that the spirit of beethoven walked about that lonely house set in the pines that the music in his soul mingled with the hum of the bees in the garden and the sigh of the winds in the trees asia stole in from the garden and stood silent by a doorway alice played to a world of her own to something in herself that had no other means of expression she played with delicacy and with passion with unerring feeling for balance light and shade mrs brayton felt that her music was the result of more than natural gifts when she had finished alice sat looking helplessly at the keys she knew she had revealed capacity for feeling and she wondered why she hated having people know how she felt oh my dear what a treat said the old lady hoarsely alice turned and was overjoyed to see what her playing had meant just then they heard whistling in the garden that is your husband mrs brayton rose to meet him alice was annoyed that he should arrive at that moment then she realized that he had been asked there to dinner several times on his own merits before he could possibly have gained any glory by exhibiting her as his wife and he had dared to whistle familiarly to announce his approach through that garden tom roland entered boisterously a hurricane of vitality the venuses and the apollos seemed to sway as he passed well said mrs brayton gaily how's the bush oh pretty good tramway's begun soon you'll see the logs coming like grease lightning down that slope to the bay things'll hum i tell you i'm sure they will she laughed sitting down quickly lest he should do so first and be a fresh cause of humiliation to his too observant wife in his rough tweed suit hardly clean he dropped into a tapestry chair his reddish head against the background of the winged victory he stretched out his legs and beat a tattoo on the chair arms his green eyes roving my dear said mrs brayton to alice with a twinkle in her eye your husband has turned us all upside down men from the gum fields and boys from the farms are all flocking to his standard he's a born leader but he's wasted here he should have been in the army tom roland laughed shortly ah oh, she don't appreciate me she ain't interested in the bush well she's never seen one 
I was not interested till you took me through those wonderful trees that day. And you know, I think you were a vile vandal for cutting them down. Pooh, if you thought of things like that, you'd never do anything. Quite true. The race is not to the delicate. It's to the ruthless and the strong. Don't know anything about that, but I do know that if you are a ninny you never get anywhere, and you never get anything done. He poked a finger into one ear, and tapped with his feet upon the carpet. Mrs. Brayton laughed. Alice, who had moved into a low chair, sat back watching them. In that incredible afternoon, this seemed the most incredible thing of all. Ever since her marriage to Tom Roland, she had avoided bringing him near the few friends she had made. She saved herself the pain of contrasts. His long absences had made this easy. Now she was face to face with the most vivid contrast she could have imagined, and it was not working altogether as she had expected it would work. She could not help seeing that the fastidious English lady tremendously admired the unpolished colonial. She was glad when Harold Brayton came in. He represented things she was familiar with, manners she expected, responses she wanted. And he knew what she stood for in life, and appreciated her. She did not mind that he was a mild person who would never get anywhere, that he was not an empire builder. He was an English gentleman. That was his password to her esteem. But she saw her husband in rather a different light before the evening was over, and as they walked home with their arms full of flowers, she told him she would like to see the bush. End of chapter 3「four of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four there now we begin to see them said mrs brayton she stood with alice asia and roland on a cleared track in the gap beside mount pukikaroro they had come up through the fern and the scrub and the outer fringe of bush by way of the cleared line cut for the tramway they had passed one gang of men laying rails and they now stood at the place where the low bush ended and the real forest began with an open avenue before them cut as far as they could see down a slight incline through the glorious tangle of undergrowth the sunlight sneaking through the treetops picked out spots upon the mould and trampled ground and on the trunks of trees and in the vivid heads of giant ferns with a catch of her breath alice saw towering up out of the green depths on either side of that open way row upon row of colossal grey pillars seemingly as eternal as the hills losing themselves above in a roof of impenetrable green the pungent smell of their innumerable little cones mingled with the heavy smell of banks of moss about their roots a faint sound of the morning breeze stirring in their topmost fringe of leaves leaked downwards there roland put down the luncheon baskets he was carrying and waved his hand airily at them. Best bit of bush in the colony. Nothing to beat it outside of California. Those trees have stood there thousands of years, might have stood there thousands more. And you're going to cut them down? exclaimed Alice, as if it were a sacrilege. You bet I am. Great job, too. Take some tackling. He was proud that he had dared to stake everything he possessed on this great adventure. He knew that he was being discussed in Auckland business circles as a bold spirit and as a coming man. "'I've told you what I think about it,' said Mrs. Brayton. "'Rot!' laughed Tom Roland. "'What would you have people live in in this country? Timber is cheaper than bricks. Those trees make houses for the poor. Somebody has to cut them down. Look at the people who can own their own houses in New Zealand. Why? Cheap land. Cheap timber. Something you don't have in England. And you talk sentiment to me.' Pooh, Come on. He took up the baskets. After they had moved on a little way, they heard the reverberating sounds of axes swung by a gang of men working on ahead. Alice walked silently, Asia as usual holding her hand, and gasping and pointing at intervals at things that thrilled her. They had now been three weeks at the bay, and Alice had learned that there was a village at Kaiwaka, two miles past Mrs. Brayton, where six houses, a church, and a store stood within sight of each other. She had learned that there was a fortnightly mail. She had learned also that there were possibilities in Tom Rowland's scheme, that there would soon be a village at the bay with its store, and some day even its school. She had learned, too, that she might be able to live on by the river without having daily visions of premature decay and death. She was twenty-eight and healthy, and she knew she would take some killing. 
she had begun to see the sense of trying to fit in of readjusting her sense of values of learning the language that belonged to the mountain and the river on two afternoons in the last week she had taken the children to the top of the green hill behind the house and had sat under the straggly cabbage trees she had looked across the gully at the block of pines and had pictured the old lady in the garden within and the peacocks strutting on the lawn and she had looked down the river through the gap at the low hills indigoed in the vista beyond and at the walls of forest to the north and at the mountain cutting a great wedge out of the eastern sky then her thoughts came back to the babies pulling grass beside her and to asia making daisy chains she saw how they loved it and because it was going to be good for them it had to be good for her she was determined that outwardly at least she would be cheerful about it she knew that mrs brayton was the chief factor in this effort at reconstruction already she loved the old lady with a passion born of years of longing for some kindred spirit as she walked crumbling twigs and chips underfoot alice felt around her the stirring beginning of things no one could have realized that invaded silence of ages have seen those violent assaults upon eternal peace without feeling that it was a big thing to break in she heard tom roland talking of tramways of engines and trucks racing along the slopes of dams and waterways of mills and ships as he outlined once more his plans for future greatness and there was something powerfully arousing about it all it had fired mrs brayton it began to fire her the ringing thud of axes the crackle of disturbed undergrowth and the sounds of voices and the clanging of iron tools grew louder at the end of the avenue they came out upon a clearing beside the rocky bed of a shallow creek it was here they were to see felled one of the kauri trees roland explained that this was to be the site of a camp and tool and truck depot four tents stood to one side near them a group of men were putting up the framework of a wooden building great piles of rough-hewn sleepers were stacked up here and there logs had been jacked to one side and the earth flattened by the rolling over it the ground was covered with chips and small branches crushed into the loose soil men in all kinds of singlets and dungarees were sawing logs squaring sleepers clearing away the wrecks of tree heads and making ready to dynamite a large stump here's our tree said roland pointing straight across the clearing at a gray pillar exposed against the forest background biggest we've tackled yet it's right in the way of the tramway they saw men at its base blocking an unsightly gash upon its farther side roland laid down his baskets they'll be ready soon he said moving forward to a group of men whom he hailed with free and easy air with varying degrees of accuracy of aim and thoroughness they all sent a hand to their heads or caps as they caught sight of the women of the party alice saw david bruce standing some distance away guarding the dynamite her eyes rested on him for some seconds asia saw him too mother there's mr bruce she said as if she were claiming an old friend i see said alice frigidly my dear broke in mrs brayton do you see that thin fair man talking to your husband he's the son of an earl there are some queer mixtures in this bush just look at this face nearest us roland says he is the most reckless blackguard he has ever known they call him shiny they must be a sweet family to manage my god what has he done the man named shiny had suddenly dropped his axe and doubled up with a violent volley of oaths oh he's hurt cried alice and to the astonishment of mrs brayton she ran towards him she saw blood gushing from his thick boot tom she called but already two men had reached his side and alice heard bruce's name shouted sharply shiny stopped blaspheming as he saw her pardon ma'am he said gruffly as he began to undo his boot as alice stood helpless with no notion as to what to do first but with an instinctive feeling that she ought to help david bruce ran up she saw the men gathering round make way for him and she saw that he was the man for that emergency rags he commanded and salt said shiny two men started for the tents bruce knelt down and as he pulled off shiny's boot a jet of blood shot out from the gashed foot alice turned her head away then she forced herself to look back i have clean towels she said to bruce yes please he answered looking up at her as he closed the wound with his hands as she hurried to the luncheon baskets she wondered if the look in his eyes had been meant for approval and she knew that she hoped it had been by the time she reached him the men from the tent 
ran up with a bundle of rags and the kitchen bag of salt the wounded man who sat up throughout reached for the ladder and dived his dirty hand into it lord man exclaimed bruce best thing to stop bleedin answered shiny defiantly yes if you can stand it bruce took off his sock and shiny rammed the handful of clean salt into his gaping squirting wound they saw him clench his hands but he never made a sound even the boss looked at him with admiration alice leaned down with her towels thank you said bruce looking up again into her face he made a pad of one towel cut the other into strips and rapidly bandaged the foot and doubled up the leg alice walked back to the place where mrs brayton stood holding asia's hand somehow the accident had affected her feeling for the place had put a touch of kinship into it that was not there before that man put a handful of salt in that cut and never groaned she said hoarsely mrs brayton smiled why not they have marvellous nerve some of these men are there often accidents gasped alice anticipating fresh horrors what will they do here without a doctor why there is a doctor david bruce is a doctor didn't you know that alice looked at her too amazed to speak yes my dear he isn't registered in new zealand and can't practise for money but he is a fully qualified english surgeon he could get registered any time he chose he's the only doctor this place is likely to have and it's lucky to have him considering dr mount of mangatoroto is eighteen miles away alice looked down overwhelmed by the thought that had entered her mind the group about shiny had broken up and now bruce and the boss and one of the men were carrying him to the camp the women waited where they were till roland returned nasty cut he said good man too no use for a week or two now always the way when you're in a hurry now they're about ready over there he set off towards the creek and called to the men who were working at the base of the tree it was to fall across the stream and a little to one side roland selected a safe spot in the clearing some sixty yards from it a sharp whistle rang out some of the men laid down their tools to watch there were cries of ready and answering calls from those in the danger zone then the little group of fellers put in the last wedges and drew away from the base of the doomed tree now then said roland the little party stood tense their faces turned upwards to the magnificent head of spreading branches stretching into the deep morning blue there was not yet a quiver in all the dark mass of foliage no sign of capitulation to the wanton needs of man straight as the course of a falling stone the slaty gray trunk shot up seventy feet without a knot nothing could seem more triumphantly secure suddenly there was a suggestion of quiver the skyline wavered she's coming said roland the whole world seemed to lurch slowly slowly then the top branches shook the great trunk swayed the foundations cracked the whole tree gave one gigantic shiver poised for an instant suspended hesitating and then realizing as it were the remorselessness of fate it plunged forward filling the whole visible world and crackling horribly till its longest branches caught the ground with a series of tearing ripping sounds preliminary to the resounding roar as the massive trunk struck and rebounded and rolled upon the earth the air was filled with dust and flying twigs the whole clearing shook and from the sides of pukikaroro the echoes came rolling back there followed a short extraordinary silence into which there returned by degrees the familiar sounds of the axes and the revolving handles of the jacks there that's over said the boss cheerfully i guess we can have lunch now you stay here this is a good place by the creek he could not understand why alice had tears in her eyes or why she looked at him as if he had committed a crime he set off for the luncheon baskets swinging his arms and whistling gaily mrs brayton alice and even asia stood silent till bruce came up to them i'm afraid you will have to move he said we are going to dynamite a stump and things will fly about a bit will you go to the edge of the forest there by the creek he led the way this is safe he said finally selecting a spot where he left them there are times when i hate being a woman said mrs brayton with disgust this is where you and i are nobody folding her heavy tweed skirt under her she sat down upon a rock this is why men dominate us my dear she waved her hand at the clearing sheer brute strength alice who had always been a drawing-room woman took her words too seriously 
she looked round the clearing at the various evidences of that brute's strength and felt herself trapped into submission by it never in her life before had she been face to face with such an exhibition of physical power it overwhelmed her with a sense of her own helplessness mother look cried asia pointing to the stump with a loud explosion the earth about its roots heaved up and the stump itself was lifted several feet into the air then it settled down the torn roots obtruding asia danced about shrieking with delight killing her impulse to subdue her alice sat down beside mrs brayton no wonder women have to submit to men she said dejectedly goodness don't say that i've never submitted to them my dear you don't know how to manage them they're more afraid of our tongues than we are of their muscles cultivate a tongue alice smiled doubtfully at her but she said nothing for she did not want to convey the impression that she did not know how to manage roland asia rushed up to her mother is mr bruce coming to our picnic they saw him coming towards them with the boss very likely alice tried to speak naturally mrs brayton was amused at the sudden change in her asia ran to meet the men you are coming to our picnic she cried to bruce i have been invited he answered solemnly he had not had a meal with them since the day of their arrival though it had sometimes been difficult to dodge roland's peremptory invitations oh how nice said the child alice bowed with restrained courtesy as bruce raised his hat to her the boss examined the ground around them yep yeah, this isn't a bad spot we can make a fire here did you bring a billy dear me no said mrs brayton plenty at the camp said bruce promptly i'll get one. Oh, may i go too mother asked asia but alice silenced her by a look good heavens burst out her husband nothing will harm her the men won't eat her she's got to get used to them anyway oh very well alice flushed with anger as she turned to unpack the baskets she hated interference between herself and asia and this incident was enough to spoil the day for her bruce and asia returned immediately the child swinging the tin can she was allowed to fill it with water from the creek and then the boss fixed it cunningly on cleft sticks above his fire while alice spread out the lunch on a clean tablecloth mrs brayton had supplied most of the food there were two chickens ham sandwiches homemade bread and butter and honey the fire blazed merrily beside them and the stream trickled slowly along its shallow stony bed the clearing had grown strangely quiet as one by one the men had thrown down their tools and gathered in the kitchen tent intermittent sounds of gruff laughter drifted over to them the sun shone out above the clearing in a cloudless sky they smelt the earth and the sweet chips and the moss and the fern on the banks of the stream black and white fantails flew about them inquisitively to asia's delight the breeze murmured in the forest behind now what's wrong with this demanded roland looking at his wife as he set down the boiling billy don't this beat your drawing-room teas alice determined to be pleasant i think it is very enjoyable she said they arranged themselves around the tablecloth asia sat herself next to bruce and during a lull she fired one of those bombshells that had made alice decide a dozen times never to go out with her again mother she said looking very puzzled and serious i wish you would like mr bruce i think he's lovely then she choked on her sandwich as she saw the swift gleam that flashed across her mother's eye for an instant there was one of those awful silences when a group of people are struck dumb self-conscious helpless before the open expression of things they are not accustomed to express david bruce did not lose his presence of mind his profession had taught him how to deal with people as children he found that simpleness and naturalness could take the wind out of the sails of the most persistent convention he turned his sad eyes upon asia who was looking as if she were on the verge of tears i'm glad you like me he said gravely but there is no reason why everybody should or why they should show that they do in the way you show it don't you know that everybody is different don't you know that we all like different things and different people and that we all have different ways of showing that we like the same thing when you see something you like you jump into the air and shriek and clap your hands now i like lots of things you like but i don't jump and shriek at them i did when i was a boy but we alter as we grow up took a delicate bite out of his sandwich and went on you think that because your mother doesn't call me david as mrs brayton does or rush at me and take my hand as you do here roland broke into a loud guffaw 
that she doesn't like me but all people treat me differently even all people who like me and why shouldn't they asia was now looking up at him with great interest he had been determined to restore her peace of mind he could never bear the unhappiness of children he had a very different feeling towards adults who manufactured and perpetuated so much of their own embarrassment why are people different she asked we don't know but don't you think it's a good thing they are he smiled i don't know she said very puzzled i think grown-up people are very queer yes my dear he said gravely we are often very queer and very stupid and i'm sure i don't know why we are there was a note of weariness in his voice shall i be queer she asked she had now forgotten the origin of the conversation very i should say he replied with emphasis and at that mrs brayton and roland laughed loudly oh dear said asia oh never mind smiled bruce his eyes lighting up everybody else will be queerer than you during this time alice had sat forcing herself to eat and drink she had not dared to look at anybody for the first moment she had been too sick to think she had always felt embarrassment as positive pain she had never been able to cope with a difficult situation and she was one of those who always make the situation worse for everybody else the worst thing about this was that her attitude to bruce had been put into words she felt now as if a net had been drawn round her from which she could never escape the thing said was so much worse than unsaid she would hear it when she looked at mrs brayton she was afraid roland might speak about it to her but as bruce had talked on another element had entered into her feeling she was amazed at his simpleness and naturalness and at the power of personality that lay behind his management of the situation he had done so easily what to her was an impossible thing in spite of herself she had to admire him and be grateful to him she could not recover her self-possession during that meal but she managed to get through it without attracting attention or thought she did mrs brayton got a chance after lunch to speak to bruce david what an awful moment how could you manage it like that good lord when you have stood by as many deathbeds as i have and have seen the backyard side of people as i have you don't get upset by trifles it was awful for her it didn't have to be but some women enjoy misery when she has had enough of it she will decide to enjoy something else she's beginning to like you david he laughed she is progressing that way three weeks ago i was a piece of machinery today i am at least a human being good laughed the old lady i shall expect to hear next week that you are practicing the kreutzer sonata together he smiled if she's considering that in a year's time she will be very smart well david if he can't do better than that her eyes gleamed with mischief he raised his eyebrows at her but he knew there was no serious significance in her words smiling at her he turned back to his work mrs brayton alice and asia walked back to the bay together in the middle of the afternoon the conversation consisted mostly of asia's questions and observations and of mrs brayton's answers alice made painful efforts to appear natural and to make casual remarks mrs brayton helped her by providing all the diversion she could they stopped to pick ferns and moss and the old lady explained how they could be kept fresh by careful treatment she told asia the names of the trees and the creepers she told them the strange history of the rata vine the powerful forest parasite and by good luck found one of the chrysalis worms from which it is said to grow in spite of herself alice was interested in this story she was astonished at mrs brayton's fund of information and envied her her lively interest in everything that night soon after they had finished dinner bruce knocked at the boss's back door he had in his hands the luncheon baskets that roland had forgotten to bring down from the bush alice was just walking out to shake the tablecloth when his figure loomed up in the doorway the light of the kitchen candle fell upon his face bruce ignored the fact that she started and flushed i've just brought your baskets mrs roland he said oh thank you she stammered not daring to look at him then nervousness drove her to ask after the injured man he's getting on all right thank you he isn't worrying they rather like accidents some of those chaps gives them a rest he was turning away when roland who had heard his voice called from the front room oh bruce is that you come in and give me a hand with these calculations while alice and asia washed up the voices of the two men checking figures formed a low accompaniment asia said her mother as she hung up the damp towels i am going outside for a while 
you go to the children if they cry wrapping a shawl round her head and shoulders she walked out into the spring night along the cliffs to a spot where a huge solitary totra tree grew precariously upon the edge she sat down upon one of the uncovered roots and with her head in her hands gazed down upon the river running still under the stars there was not a sound of lapping against the white beach at her feet alice and roland had been married four years they had met in christchurch soon after her arrival in new zealand in a tragic moment when she was almost penniless and sick with dread of the future he had been kind and helpful something told her that he was honest with her but she had not borrowed money from him without much prayerful consideration when he suggested that she should come north to auckland where he lived and knew many people and where he promised to get her the music pupils she needed it seemed too much like the finger of the lord for her to refuse after many appeals to god to help her she finally accepted his offer because there was absolutely nothing else between her and starvation roland had done all he promised and more he found her music pupils and he financed her beginnings he took her to a quiet boarding-house kept by a friend of his where she was comfortably and decently fed he managed her all along by his frankness his general decency and his vitality he had proposed marriage to her almost without any previous signs of affection he had been rather blunt about it but she thought that was due to nervousness she had taken a week to think about it every time she was in danger of refusing she had looked at asia every time she was in danger of accepting she had looked into her own heart finally with her eye on asia she had accepted him but not entirely without feeling for him she saw that people liked him and she guessed that he would get on and she was attracted by his impulsive kindness and by his sweeping energy and so she had married him determined to do her duty and hoping to get some happiness by the way but very soon after the marriage the incompatibilities began to assume those undreamt of proportions that are the despair of those who do their duty before a year was over alice felt that a good deal of her had died roland's reasons for marrying her had been a curious mixture of impulsive need of affection and business acumen and a satisfaction in being benevolent he saw in her a poor but beautiful young widow who would very well fit in with his schemes for future greatness and social recognition he would never have admitted his class inferiority but in his secret heart he knew he valued her largely because she belonged to the class that ruled the world naturally he expected a return for his money and he looked for that when he proposed to her but at the same time he had a comforting sense of his own goodness in rescuing her from the necessity of making her way slowly by teaching the piano there was more heart in it however than either he or she suspected and it was this unsatisfied heart in him that drove him to the other women to them he went for the stimulus and affection that she could not or would not give and back to her he came for the logical conclusion that she never refused because she had contracted to give it they had never openly quarrelled once or twice when he had come blustering she had risen and left the room afterwards ignoring the breaks there were times when her calmness nearly drove him mad but he had extraordinary common sense and he knew it was useless to rage at her within a year he too had begun to see that something he had hoped for had gone out of their union if indeed it had ever been in it the thing that annoyed him most was that he could not make her love him he felt that something tumultuous lay beneath her calm it piqued his curiosity he tried to be good to her and he wondered why the devil he was always wrong he was just as determined as she was to do his duty thus far they had drifted when they came to the bay ever since learning of the isolation of bush life alice had looked forward with alternating moments of resolute calm and wild despair to a future of self-suppression save in so far as she could grow again in her children the possibility of any other man in her life had never occurred to her on this day of the picnic it entered her consciousness for the first time she felt before that this something about david bruce challenged her her thoughts had turned to him many times in those three weeks now the knowledge that he was a doctor forced her to think of the possibilities arising from his position if her children met with sudden illness or accident she would have to send for him intimacy seemed to be inevitable and then she had always surrounded doctors with the halo that most women put upon them and curates and bishops and reformers 
believing them to be the props of mankind seized with a premonition of evil she stared up at the stars and then at their reflection in the river she now saw in bruce the unconscious breaker of her fine scheme of lifelong martyrdom this meant that he was another thing to fight she must kill her impulses even to think of him she tried to feel that she had thought of him only because she had treated him badly that it would be quite easy not to think of him any more because of her behaviour to him she knew he would make no advance and the best thing would be just to go on as she had begun and let him think her cold and distant she could be courteous of course but she was secretly afraid of her impulses she could not understand why any one who hated them as much as she did should have them so violently she had been taught and she still believed that impulses were monstrous inventions of evil to be fought and suppressed her own experience had altogether taught her their terrible results when assurance that whom the lord loveth he chasteneth had never filled her with the satisfaction said to be enjoyed by those who believe that god uses them to demonstrate eternal laws for years she had lived so apart she did not realize how in the world about her the impulses and instincts had begun their innings backed up by biology and the individualists as powers to be discussed lauded developed and allowed to run their riotous course unlocked she did not know that the instincts had now accumulated a cult along with the eugenists the feminists the cremationists and bernard shaw new zealand even more than any other part of the world seethed with the atmosphere of social and moral experiments but in its boarding-houses the last stronghold of organized prudery and artificial and anemic chastity no wandering vibrations of the zeitgeist had ever reached her no thought of having any fun with any other men had ever entered her mind she did not see any human relation as fun and the mere thought that she might come to care for david bruce filled her with alarm but she reflected as she sat there if nothing ever began there would be nothing to fight all she had to do was to prevent the beginnings she began calmly to think of ways and means her treatment of david bruce now seemed like a blessing in disguise she would go on as she had begun that is she would keep him at the distance she had already made inevitable in any case there was nothing else for her to do there was no reason for her to like him if she did not wish to there was no reason why she should openly accept him as anything but a mere acquaintance after all it was simple duty always was when you faced it clearly she realized that above all things she wanted peace she thought of her compensations she had mrs brayton and her children she had her music and her books she had a home such as it was and there was her husband she knew now that he was a power in the land he would make money and perhaps he really meant to do his best for her and the children she determined that she would try to think better of him with tears dropping from her cheeks she bowed her head under the stars and prayed to god to help her then she got up and walked calmly and serenely home End of chapter four